Coffin. Hey, everybody. Happy Sunday. Welcome to It's Center Live. I'm your host, Kelly Barrett. Uh, we got a really fun show for you today, and I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Can't think of a better way to end off a great weekend. Uh, we have uh, a gentleman who's very well known and well respected in the Canadian music industry. He is a road manager, stage manager, drummer, drum tech, and he has got a lot of cool stories. So, uh, yeah, Michael Pachelak, welcome. Who, who are you talking about? <laughs> Me? Oh, oh, wrong yeah. show, wrong show, wrong show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is Price is Right, isn't it? No. Yeah. No. Hey, how's it going, Kelly? I'm doing great, thanks. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Great to see you. Okay. I was, you know, I was on the phone waiting for you to call last night. I was like, never called. Jeez. I, you know, I found myself in a farmer's field at a music festival. It was the strangest thing. And how did was, you get? How did you get there? <laughs> I just like beamed over there. Uh, <laughs> yes, but uh, but I did text you, and so and here we are. Today. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't want people to think I just totally blew Michael Patchelock off. Oh well, there you go. That's there not the case. <laughs> I want to. I want to first start off by thanking uh, uh, Lee Aaron, if that's her real name. For giving me a shout out the other day, she was. Awesome, <laughs> she nice. didn't know who I was, right? So, you know, sometimes you uh, you work with artists and you don't you don't you know you don't interact and stuff like that. But I did lots of fair amount of gigs with her with Age of Electric. We did a uh, a warm up situation in Ontario one time, and I oh. got to uh, got to mix her doing her jazz thing one time. It was oh, cool. really cool. It was at a, a festival here in Salmon Arm. And uh, wow, that was a that was a treat to to mix that. It was so good, right? She's how many albums she got now? Oh, I you know I wouldn't even be able to be able to count. And she's this, the uh, she's, woman is so driven, you know, you know so Michael, cool. She's been on the show three times, and mm -hmm. every time she, every time she's been on, she's had a new album, a new album, I like, know, in the works kind of thing, right? Yeah. And uh, of course, just did her new live album in uh, at the Alma Combo in Toronto. Yeah, very on cool. the weekend. So yeah, one of the hardest working women in show business. And, and, just, and such and, a great band, Sean yeah. Kelly and John and 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 Dave Reimer. Dave, I mean, phew, yeah. man. Yeah, serious talent there. I know John from uh, collecting vintage drums and stuff, right? So that's that's my connection there to them. So. Yeah, right on. Yeah, I saw some footage of the show and it just looked amazing. Yeah, yeah, 100%. yeah. they do. So they're, they're so great. I bet you've toured with a, a lot of people. Like, a, it, and is it mostly Canadian artists that you've toured with, Michael? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I started off doing like, uh, I mean, I played for uh, about. Three, 13, 14 years with nobody, you know, it was just small town kind of stuff in that. Right. And then I started mixing uh, in 82, some club bands. I, I like, uh, like I did a band called Section 8, Blade Runner, uh, uh, Dirty Urge with Mike Braniff, right? And right. Uh, so just a host of, of different bands. And then I got connected with the Age of Electric and that. And from there, you know, things just kind of started moving along and I just started mixing a lot of other people in that. So but Great. yeah most mostly brian no touring you know worldwide uh i did brian all adams, three, of course. i did all three of the roadside attraction tours uh did the little affair tour um yeah no there's just, just so many right you know so yeah could you write a book i bet you could write a book or two i i could <laughs> i i did this i did this with mike braniff one time right when i did his thing and i just went you know th these are like you know those different bands right you know so <laughs> I finally compiled it during the uh, during the COVID thing, and there's like I think there was about 700 groups that I've either worked with or toured wow. with or did shows with, or you know, I worked at a casino in Vancouver for at the River Rock and Red Robinson, and uh, you know, did a host of different kind of artists there, right? So it was pretty cool. Yeah. So it's kind of like a scrapbook of like a scrapbook of who's who and what and who you've done what with them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So and and you know, and it's quite diverse too. It's not just rock and roll, right? You know, like it's I bet. Really did the Wally Nelson tours. I did three summers with him. It was so great, you know. So, yeah. Tell Lots us of fun. about that. Tell us about Willie. What was that like? Willie? <laughs> God, he just turned 89. Incredible. You know, that that was, there's so much history with everybody in that group, you know. thing is about it is that, you know, him and his sister Bobby were abandoned as children. You know, they were born in Abbott, Texas. Uh, and they were, they were brought up by their grandparents. And their grandparents were very were, you know, church people and stuff. So they learned how to sing and play in church all the time, right? right. So there's a little bit of a, a documentary on Willie and he talks about Abbott, Texas. And and uh, uh, he shows him looking at, he's outside of town and he's looking up and he's going, Abbott, Texas, population 300. <laughs> and he goes, you know, as long as I can remember, Abbott, Texas has always been population 300. Seems time, seems every time a child is born, a man leaves town. <laughs> you know? 
so, <laughs> but you know, such a, a, a wonderful, like, you know, a family, it's, it really is a family there. Right. So unfortunately, you know, his, his core band have all passed away and, and his sister Bobby, you know, passed away last spring here. And, uh, yeah, the the coolest part about about uh, you know we used to go golfing with Willie. We'd hop on his bus, you know, and go golfing on days off. Cool. And you walk on the bus, and he's sitting in the front lounge, and he's got a big stainless steel uh, salad bowl full of pot, <laughs> right? And he's rolling joints for everybody, right? And just tossing them, right? and I'm standing there looking at him, going, and we're talking joints like that, <laughs> <and> <laughs> pinners, right? So yeah. But uh, a lot of fun. They were just they were just such a wonderful organization to work with, right? It was really cool, really cool. And and you know, Willie lives for today. You know, he doesn't. What happened yesterday? He doesn't worry about that. What's going to happen tomorrow is isn't a given. So you don't know, right? So he just lives for today, and I think that's what's sustaining him. I remember I remember we were we were in Kamloops on a day off, and I used to have a bicycle, an old bicycle on the road and everything. And he came walking, and, oh, old Western Flyer, right? and like wow, he knew this bike. Not more than an hour later, somebody stole his bicycle from the front oh. of the bus. Oh. And the only thing he said was, well, I guess somebody else needed it more than I did. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah. What a, it sounds like a really kind soul. And I he think, is. He and I think when, you're, when you're smoking the ganja lots, I think it's easier <laughs> to be a little more laid back about stuff like that, maybe. <laughs> they used to, I remember, uh, you know, for the first three three tours, I used to you know be walking around the arena and stuff. And I used to see the sign on this door. It said tuning room, right? And uh, on the last tour, about maybe the second to last show on the last tour that I did, I, like, I got to go to the washroom. So I, okay, I walked in and the smell of pot would have knocked you over. That was there, <laughs> there was the room for, for smoking pot, right? So, the, the pot room. It was, it was, <laughs> yeah. So, but right yeah. on. Well, you know, Michael, we got some people popping in already that want to say hello. So, uh, Claudia Santiago, who's a musician from Calgary, she's just saying hello, Kelly and Michael. Hello. Hi, Claudia. Uh, Ron Ron Hockey says, "Yo, Patch, keep on having fun." Uh, well, do you know do you know Ron Hockey? I do know Ron. Yes, <laughs> yeah, same to you, Ron. We're we're still doing it, right? So, yeah. right on. Uh, Fabi Boucher is a nice, good friend of mine and fan of the show. Is just saying good evening. Paul Denton uh, is a local <laughs> musician. You must know Paul. <laughs> I've got such a great story about him. Oh, go oh, go ahead. Tell us. Hi, Paul. By the way, did Hi, he? Paul. As, as we used to call him. In, Tinty, in you're about to get right? roasted, Paul. <laughs> we, you know, every band has its own flavor of comedy, right? Right. Yeah, we all have our own little thing, right? And we were in a band called Tom Foolery. I was mixing them, and Paul came in, and and we used to quote Spinal Tap all the time. And and Paul would always be looking at us, going, "What are you, what are you guys talking about? Well, Spinal Tap." He goes, "What's that?" And we all went. <laughs> You don't know what Spinal Tap is? Were you, you on know, the rock? <laughs> so, you know, we're on the road kind of thing. So we had a Sunday night and we went and rented a video machine and we rented Spinal Tap, right? And we're having a Spinal Tap night and he's watching and everything. And there was a part where Dennis uh, or the, uh, oh, uh, the bass player was being interviewed and he's smoking his pipe. And, and there was really nothing happening. And all of a sudden, Paul falls on the floor laughing hysterically. Like, and we're all looking at each other going, What's what's so funny? He's okay. laying on the floor and he's pointing at the, at the <laughs> television set, right? What's going on? Finally, when he kind of got his senses together, he says, "Well, see the the soccer jersey he's wearing." And Paul's from from the UK, right? You know, so right. he goes, "That jersey is was is, is a team that is like the worst record in all the British soccer <laughs> history." So we go, "Okay, well, we learned something today, right?" So, so hi, hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. Good Such a great guy, great bass player. He's a great. He lives right here, and and uh, yeah, you know, bridge, right? Paul's yeah. a friend of mine. Yeah, uh, Perry Boyko is just uh, hi Kelly. How are you guys? Great show. Brad is saying hello. Uh, hi Brad, good to see you. Uh, Andy Christ says he loves your stories, Michael. Oh, thanks. Um, and so you know what? I'm going to start off with a story that I have, uh, okay. and this, and I absolutely love this one. So this this comes from Cheryl Jardine, uh, who plays with Stone Poets. And uh, you, you must know Sherelle. She's Sherelle, married. Love Sherelle. Sherelle is married to Mark from Prism. Uh, you want to hear a really, really funny story? It just happened just like a couple weeks ago. You go ahead. We were doing that, the the inaugural headpin show with Rosa and Mark and Sherelle right. were there, right? And, you know, we were always joking around kind of thing. So I came up behind Sherelle and I started massaging her in front of Mark, right? <laughs> and Mark looks at me and goes, 
you have exactly one half hour to get your hands off my wife. <laughs> I, I almost died. I was laughing so hard. One half hour. Oh, God. Um, I love those two. I love those two. You know, interesting fact while we're bringing them up, Mark and Sherelle were the first people I ever interviewed. Yes, ever, that's right. Ever, ever. Yeah. yeah, and so I ever, and they just made me feel so comfortable and, and you know, and, yep. and uh, yeah, so I have a real soft spot in my heart. If there's, if there's ever a couple that belongs together, it is truly it's those them. Two. They are so connected, so great. Right? They are. It's it's yeah. beautiful to see. And so, uh, actually, this story Sherelle sent in for the last show, but it's so crazy that I'm going to share it again. So, <laughs> Sherelle says, the one that sticks out for me is when I was releasing my Something Good Is Happening album, and it was her solo album. Mm -hmm. I tore my Achilles heel playing baseball. So she had a full leg cast and had a huge festival that she was booked in. Uh, she did the show. One of the crew members helped me on the stage. And at the end of the show, no one was on it to help her off. So she actually fell on stage. How embarrassing. Oh, no. but, that, but that's not even the crazy part. That's nothing compared to... <laughs> So there were lots of people taking photos of me with my lovely cast. After the show, people were signing it. All good. A few weeks goes by, and I start getting all these emails on my website. I'm talking like hundreds a day. Mm -hmm. Each one saying they loved my music, uh, wanted to buy my CD, they loved me and wanted to know when they could see me play again. So side note, this makes sense, guys, because Sherelle is gorgeous. Sherelle is talented. So at this point, the story is still kind of making sense that all these mm -hmm. people would email her, right? Um, so hundreds more emails. I, I got a few that didn't mention my music at all. <laughs> uh, just my cast. So I asked one guy after a few emails back and forth, how did you find out about me? And he said, your photo was on a caster's website. Oh no. Oh, <laughs> it's no. a thing. It's a weird sexual thing. Um, what was that? I asked. And he said, it's a sex site for people who are into casts. <laughs> I, I kept getting more and more emails asking me more personal questions about the effing cast, not about my music. One of the emails let me know that one of the web pages had her pick on it. Oh, no. So I went on the net and plugged in the site names and started going through all the pics, and she found hers from the festival. Oh, my God. Here I thought, wow, my career is finally getting the kickstart it deserves. Uh, and all of a sudden, I become a sex goddess to the casting community. <laughs> Oh man, that's funny. What is wrong with people? I said this the last time I read this, and it's like, I mean, to each their own, no judging, but wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You never know what's out there. You yeah, know, yeah, you never know. Okay. You're into what? So Yeah, thanks, Sherelle, for sending that one in. That was that's yeah. a good one. Hi to you guys. You did great. Just, yeah. I love them guys. Uh I was working at I've worked I worked at the River Rock and the Red Robinson show theater. And a lot of times we would have like, you know, we had everybody, you know, all the, all the big name comedians, everybody. And, and a lot of the Vegas guys and stuff. And we had Dana Carvey. Oh, cool. For one night, for two nights. And what we would, a lot of times we'd flip flop. So we'd have them like say on a, on a Friday night at the River Rock and then they'd go to the Red Robinson for the Saturday night. And if we had, you know, joining bands, or whatever, we'd flip up. So, you know, a lot of comedians sometimes will ask you for local flavor, right? right. So he during the day when we were you know setting up and, and you know getting him all ready to go and everything he asked me he says say um so what's what's the trailer trash part of vancouver <laughs> right and i go oh, surrey says what Ooh, burn. <laughs> yeah, right <laughs> this is an old joke so so uh he goes uh well what's that all about and i said well you know the best i could describe it is uh what's a surrey girl do first thing in the morning Right. He goes, I don't know. Get up and go home. <laughs> right. So he went, I'm going to use that. Right. So we're at the River Rock, which is in, you know, in the uh, uh, Richmond part of town by the airport. So about five minutes into the set, he uses the line place explodes. Right. <laughs> Just like, yeah, you're funnier now. Right. So next night he goes to Coquitlam. Right. He uses the same joke. Well, a huge majority of the people that come to that show are from Surrey. Oh. Right? <laughs> and it just this is not gonna end well. <laughs> it flatlined his show. It just like from there it just went down, right? You know, so oh, we didn't hear about it, right? About, about maybe a month or two later, he's doing the late night show run, right? And uh he's on Leno, and it got this got back to us. He's on Leno and everything like that. And Leno was, hey, so what have you been up to? Has he been doing any stand-up? Oh yeah, I've been turning around. He says, 
you know, I was just up in Vancouver and stuff like that. And Leno goes, oh, you, you did the River Rock and that? And he says, yeah. And they started doing impersonations of Red Robinson, was major DJ kind of thing, right? right? And Dana goes, yeah, I, you know what? I, I asked this local guy, crew guy, this thing, you know, and, and this joke and everything. And I use it on the first night. And then the next night I use it and I bombed. I totally bombed the next night, right? And <laughs> so this story got back to us, right? So our, wow. our entertainer, you know, director he says, you know, what just happened on, on Leno the other night. This story came out, right? So, <laughs> so yeah, well, great. That's cool. Know. That's cool. So, you know, I've, I've never seen Car uh, Carby again, but it'd be interesting to, to see him again. So, it'd be great. Fun, so. That's hilarious that it made the Leno show. Like, you know, that's that's kind of big time. Well, stuff he, right he used that story a couple times, you know. So, yeah, it, yeah, it was pretty funny. So That's a great story, Michael. Yeah. That's, your, your stories involve, like, huge celebrities. <laughs> There are, yeah. So you better, yeah, cool. I, I, I understand that you are a huge Gord Downey fan. I'm a huge Gord Downey fan. And yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I I have a wonderful story with Gord. Like, Gord, if, if you've ever seen him or talked to him or anything, he's like a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Okay. Because offstage, he's the most calm, introverted, you know, and then, and then on stage, he's just this other guy, right? Right. You know, on one of the roadside tours, we were playing in Barrie, Ontario. And back then, you know, I mean, crap was flying everywhere. There was clothes, shoes, whatever, right? You, you could you could have clothed a whole small village with what was left in the crowd barrier, between the crowd barrier and the stage. <laughs> it's crazy, right? Anyways, the band had finished the night. They came back for an encore. And uh, Gord gets hit with a bottle of water. Ooh. Came flying out of the audience, right? And for a split second, I saw it happen. And for a split second, I saw just this, this moment of rage. And then he kind of stepped back, took a deep breath, and finished the show. Right? Wow. And he would show up early, like, you know, the next morning. Because we had five bands, no, six, seven bands on the main stage. So he showed up. He always showed up early in the morning. And he always had a book. He was always writing stuff down constantly. Right? So I saw him. And he said, hey, boys, how's it going today and everything? And I says, hey, Gord, how are you today? He says, great, great. Are you okay? And he goes... Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. No, I mean, I seen you get hit with that bottle of water last night. Right. Did you get hurt? And he looks at me. He's, he was quite tall, right? He was yeah. you know, over six feet and everything. He takes my hand, puts it on his heart, and says, only right here. Oh, oh, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So that's, that's the kind of guy he was. Wow, right? hey, wow. Yeah. And if, one, one more story about him. Uh, Mikey told this story, his brother, uh, he used to big hockey guy, right? Yes. One year they went to the, to the Ontario finals and they lost and he was so mad at the goalie. Right. And he was just, he was losing his mind on the ride back home and everything. Mike said, settle down. So right, whatever. Next year, I'm going to be goalie. I'm going to be goalie next year. Right. And he did. And they never lost a single game that next year. Is that right? Eh? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah he, he was a huge hockey fan. Huge. Yeah. Right. Did you ever read the book, uh, The Never Ending Present? I have not. That's, so it's it's like a bi biographical, yeah, and and uh, it's a it's a whole book written on them. And this is just a nice anecdote, but it's from the book, and, and he talks about um, they were all at some big producer's house, and it was like making a big record deal, and yeah, and uh, so the guy had them over to his match and whatever, and and apparently at the end of the meal, almost as if on cue, the entire band stood up and started clearing the table, and they went and did the dishes. <laughs> It's like this is a band that does the dishes. It's like yeah. they're tragically hip, and they're in a mansion that probably has servants. Yep. And uh, they insisted on doing the dishes after, and I just I love that story. Yeah, you know, after every tour, they would always come onto the tour buses and thank everybody personally. They were really cool that way, you know. Just good guys, yeah. hey. There's my, my uh, on the first tour, Mikey was doing his brother was doing a, a tour video, and it's it was it turned into a documentary and stuff. And so you'd always see Mikey, you know, with his camera all the time. Right. And he, uh, we were in Ottawa. And I remember I, I always had to do the monitors and stuff in the, in the big loom downstage. And I remember um, wrapping up this cable that's dark. And I see this pair of feet in front of me. I'm going, okay, I'm working my butt off. And this guy's standing there watching me do it. And I look up and it's Mikey with the camera. Oh. <laughs> and I look up and I go, oh, Mikey, don't waste your film, man. You, you know as well as I do, bass players and crew guys never get on video, okay? Oh. And I'm going to keep that. And sure enough, it's in the video. Oh, see, yeah. the humil that's humility, right? That's, you know, that that's sort of, um, you know, the type of person that acknowledges the, that everybody's important and nobody's better yep. than anybody else. And we all yeah. have a part. And yeah, 
right. it's fun right now too because Billy Ray, their their longtime crew guy, is with us on Adams. Now. Right. So, oh, so cool. I, get, I get a lot of a lot of cool inside stories from him. Right. So yeah. I bet. Yeah. And so and, Brian and Billy Adams. Ray, Billy Ray was with with Gord right to the very end. He was his right hand guy. Right. They were best friends, weren't they? they like were, kind of like were. just yeah. It said that in the book. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And so yeah. you're touring now with Brian Adams. I am. Yep. Right. Which means you're coming to Lethbridge. I am. Yeah. You coming to the show? I am planning on, I am coming to the show. Yes. So that's why you're doing this interview. Ah, <laughs> I get it. Yeah. No, you're more than welcome to come to the show. You, you come on down really. Yeah. Yeah. We'll definitely yeah, do we that. Start, sure. We start, we're doing, a, uh, we're doing a, uh, um, a private in Boston at the end of this month, uh, end of August, sorry. And then, and then uh, we started three late Canadian tour starting in the East coast. And then, and then we end up at the uh, Vancouver's the last date, and then we're going to go to Europe and Scandinavia for the for the last part of. of How the exciting! How, so, what's yeah. Brian? What's Brian like to work with? That bastard! No, you know, <laughs> what? You know what? He's he's a really hardworking guy. You know, I mean, yeah, I've he, heard. I've know, heard. He's really driven. Amazing photographer. Uh, you know, like he he shoots for Zoomer magazine in Canada all the time. Really, right? you know. Yeah, you know the naked pictures of Jan on the Zoomer. That was that was. I've Brian. not seen them, but oh, this oh. Is Brian that shot that, <laughs> right? So, but you know he's he's uh, he's just working all the time. And his voice is probably better now than it was back in the day. You know, is that right? Eh? Yeah, I mean back in the day, I mean he was screaming his guts out because we were using wedges all the time, and right. now I mean he's using in ear, so it's really saved his voice, right? So yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. And you know, and the, the nice part about the Adams gig is it supported me to, to go everywhere, you know, right? Yeah. You know, to, to go to Moscow, go to, go to, you know, just everywhere, you know, it's, it's, it's very cool. I, that's, I, I really cherish that time, you know, the I, we go up. So I bet. Yeah. And you see, speaking of amazing photographers, Lisa Guliak is in the house. Uh, <laughs> Don't we love her? Hi, Lisa. Thanks for joining us. I love her to death. You know, we've, I've known Lisa now. Hello, Lisa. Love you. You know, I've known Lisa now since like 2006. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Amazing she, photographer. Oh, she just no. takes the best pictures. Yeah. Yes. And you know Absolutely. what? Just the sweetest lady on the planet. Okay. She yes. Was, yeah. I, I'm looking forward to seeing her at Rock the River in Saskatoon. So. Yeah. yeah. That's going to be fun. That's going to be a blast. Are you going to be there? Uh-huh. Oh, well, I will see you there. We will, I will be there with the Ed Bin. And, uh, with the Ed Bin? The Ed Bin. <laughs> the Ed Bin? my only Bernie Aubin in person. So I, play, I, play, I play with the Ed Bin. <clears throat> and I, I played the hockey on the heist and I uh, played with the, the ice, and yeah. I played with the Ed Pins. Yeah. You know, Michael, I you know that wrote... you know that that I had part and turned me loose, that was me. <laughs> That's a bang on. <laughs> Uncle Bernie would love that, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> right on. You know what, Michael? I have a, I have a story about you. <laughs> oh no. So I'm gonna I'm, and it's actually it's from Mark, Mark Gladstone of Prism. Are you Mark nervous? Gladstone? Are you nervous? No, no, no. <laughs> it's it. all it's all a good fun. Yeah. So uh, I have to have a bunch of screens going on here at the same time. So he says, I was playing in Doug and the Slugs at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, aka Patch, was wasn't our usual sound man, but he was on this road trip with us. Lots of fun, lots of shenanigans. I bet. Patch had taken to calling Doug Dougie. Oh, <laughs> this is the best story ever. <laughs> And Doug wasn't taking it too well, apparently. So at one point, Doug tells Patch, don't ever call me that again or you're going to pay for it. Yeah. So, of course, Patch, being, I'm assuming, mischievous, like I'm getting that you are, uh, had to see what would happen if he did it one more time. <laughs> so he did. Uh, Doug reached into Patch's jeans, lightning quick, grabbed his underwear, and gave him the biggest wedgie I've ever witnessed in my life. He pulled Patch's underwear so hard, it stretched and ripped right up to his neck. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> and you know how that happened? What happened there was, was we were coming back from Dawson City. And I used to, I used to park my van just outside the airport. And I'd take a cab to the, the van, pick up the trooper gear, and then go back, right? So I'm right. standing outside, and they all, they all bailed into this limo, right? Hey, come on, get in, right? You know? So when I called... Doug, Dougie again, we're rolling around on the floor of the limo, right? Just <laughs> rolling, and he's, and he's red faced, and, and I'm laughing the whole time, right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, Doug was, Doug, Doug is a funny guy, man. He yeah. was so funny. Yeah. Yeah. That band, I, I loved working with them. Hi, Mark, if you're listening. 
yeah, I really like I like working with them. Cool stuff. So um, I'm going to launch into another story here just because I've got quite a few to read. So this one comes from Sean McKenna. Um, Sean's actually a musician and he has his own podcast much like this. Mm -hmm. It's called uh, Bar Stools and Band Talk. Oh, from back east, right? Yes, yes. That's right. Right, and also rim shots with Sean. And I've, I've actually That's been right. a guest. I've actually been a guest on his show. I think I saw that episode. Right, I've, I've seen a bunch of their episodes and stuff. But I think they're always drinking beer and stuff like that, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. That's it's right. very yeah. chill. Very chill program. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he says it's 1988, playing in a band in Halifax, and my agent calls me at 7 a.m. on Saturday morning. Tells me he has a show for us opening for Platinum Blonde in Bathurst, New Brunswick. No biggie, right? Uh, about a 45-minute flight. Uh, tells me to round up the band and meet at a Burger King parking lot and call him when we get there. So we do just that. Uh, so there was a gig, but it turns out we weren't flying. Oh. He, te he tells us to call a cab. <laughs> it's six hours away. He tells Holy. us to, to call a cab. The gear's on its way. Just get yourself there kind of thing. This was a six-hour drive. So we work on getting a, tab, a cab, which took two hours. Uh, it's now 1 p.m. Showtime is 7.30 p.m. We're six hours away, $600 later. So this is back in 88. So that's a lot of money. Wow, yeah. So a $600 cab ride later, um, they show up at 7.15, drive, and they drove 150 clicks an hour to show up 15 minutes before showtime. Okay, so this is great. It was a great show for about 5,000 people. Uh, so then afterwards, when they went out, every bar that they went to thought they were platinum blonde. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they weren't telling them any different. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, needless to say, we enjoyed free drinks, free food, free hotel, and lots of attention. That's uh, funny. Uh, and then he says a lot of fun for a 17-year-old. Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> Imagine the experience. This is what it's like? You know? at, at 17. Yeah. I, I had one show, I, I, a similar story to that with Trooper. Uh, I've told that many times, so it's, it's kind of an old story. Go ahead. Uh, when I was with Trooper, uh, Smitty and I were, were a team. We were the We were the... You know, we were the the pirates, or we were always together doing stuff, right? So, uh, when we were ever in Ontario, if we ever had two or three days off, usually three days off, you know, and we, everybody always wanted to go to Wasaga Beach, right? Okay, you know, yes. I, I, yes. I'm a beach guy, right? <laughs> so, you know, and Wasaga Beach is like like a throwback to like the early '60s. I mean, you know, here we are in this motel room. And it's like sweltering hot, no air conditioning. It's like really, and meanwhile, everybody else is, you know, sun worshiping out on the beach, right? So anyways, this one summer, uh, we always used to travel with a 15 passenger van, a crew, uh, a cargo van with the gear and stuff. And we're in Sarnia and Smitty goes, I don't want to go to Wasaga. I went, me neither. I never want to go to Wasaga. <laughs> he says, well, how about the other two crew guys hop in with the band, with the van, we'll take the crew van and we'll go to Niagara on the lake. Right. Great. So he, he booked a really nice suite uh, and, and then it had like a, a pull out uh, uh, um, bed, you know, couch bed, whatever. And we just had a blast, man. We, we went out and just I think our bills for food and wine was about four hundred dollars a night oh, each wow. night. We come yeah. home just just plowed. Right. You know. <laughs> so anyways, on the, on the third night, we went out and we just, we went hard, really hard. Right. And we staggered by, and, and this was a really nice place that we we're staying at. So, you know, Niagara on the lakes, a lot of older people that vacation there and everything, you know, we must have, you know, people were probably looking at us, go to these hoodlums, right? So anyways, we stagger in and we are just completely wasted. And Smitty goes, okay, we'll see you tomorrow. Okay. So he goes into his room, closes the door. Now you got to remember Smitty has been standing in front of a full on hundred watt Marshall full blast right. all his career. Right. And he's, you know, he's got du dual hearing aids. So I pull out the mattress off of the, you know, pull out couch and I throw it on the floor and I get all ready to go. And I turn on the TV with a big screen TV. Right. And I turn it on and it's like much music power hour. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I'm watching it. I'm, I mean, I'm hammered. Right. And everything. <laughs> and I just say, in the morning I wake up and everything. And then Smitty gets up and goes, what in the hell were you doing last night? I said, what? Like, you, you didn't know what you did? I go, no. I'd fallen asleep with the clicker in my hand, and my thumb hit the volume, and it went full blast. Oh, no. As loud as it could go. Right? And and Smitty, being deaf, 
is in the other room. <laughs> the whole place is shaking. Right? He goes, what the hell? And he said, when he opened the door, it was like a windstorm of volume to, go, right, to, to shut it off. And I'm just like, you know. You must have been drunk to sleep through that. Holy oh. crap. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I couldn't imagine how loud. I mean, for him to hear that in the other room, you know, it was right? all Yeah. And it's nothing, it's nothing worse than a wine hangover, too. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, thank God. <laughs> Actually, you know what? It'll be my third anniversary at in Saskatoon since I, I, I stopped drinking, right? So, yeah. Congratulations. But, yeah. yeah. Well, it was, no, it was never a problem. You know, I just drank. You know, no, but uh, Smitty and I were always a team. And, and I that whole trooper time was just so much fun, man. I, I bet. You know, I've seen so much of this country with those because we played everywhere, you know? And, and, uh, you know, their favorite place, as they'll always say, is St. John's, Newfoundland. And Newfoundland oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, Newfoundland is, is like they are the kings of Newfoundland. They truly are. They're really, yeah, fun, fun, fun stuff. Right on. Trooper, Trooper's a great band, too. Donnie, Donnie was on the show here. Donnie. I saw that. Yeah, and he's, he just he had some good stories, too. And That's funny, it, you know, on that show, because when you mentioned my name on there, right? They said, oh, yeah, he's the guy that had the bar and everything. I'm going, what? <laughs> 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 I did their 25th anniversary show. And, right. and where they were rehearsing uh, was at this this biker kind of bash bar or whatever. And uh, the the rehearsals <coughs> were, I would say, five times better than the actual show. Oh, is that right? Yeah, because it was magic because these guys hadn't seen each other for so long. Harry Kalinsky oh, I, right. came in for a couple of days and, and everybody. And it was just a big like high school reunion, you know. And when, when I got them set up and ready to go and everything, and they Smitty goes, well, what do you want to start with, right? Oh, let's do here for good time. And they kicked it in. And it's like time it stood still. They banged it off in a heartbeat. It was unbelievable, right? Right. But I, re I remember Donnie, uh, the because everybody got introduced individually as like the progression of the band's years. And right. Stuff, right. Right. So when Donnie came on, he had a stack of Trooper forty fives, and he walked across the whole front of the stage, and he was handing out Trooper forty fives to everybody to front. It was really cool. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Good memory. I love that band. They've got so many great hits. Oh. Right? Like just man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I was with them for seven years. And I, they were probably one of my favorite bands to work with. Uh, right. Just never sound checked the band. I only did four sound checks out of 600 shows. You know, is that so right? Eh? Yeah, right. they were totally throw and go all the time. Right, it was just me and a crew guy getting levels and go. Right, so so it was it was <laughs> sink or swim sometimes. But, you know, right, so, yeah, was there shenanigans? Thing. I feel like there's shenanigans with Trooper. <sighs> Come you know. on, <laughs> Where do I start? You're not, you're not working with them anymore, so you're good, right? <laughs> no, you know what? You know what's you know what's the coolest part about it is is you know they, you know when Trooper came to town, it's oh Uncle Smitty and Uncle Ray are coming to town, we gotta go, you know. So that, yeah, that was always sort of the feeling from people, you know. So yeah, fun, fun time, right. a lot of fun. Well, yeah. you know, you know who's in the house? Bernie Aubin. <laughs> Hello, Bernie. How's it going, brother? <laughs> he said, "Hey, I'm listening." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just talking to him earlier, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a that's a great accent that you do. Well, let's try my best, you know. <laughs> well, now and now with Rosa, he's he's met his match there because she's, you know, she's French too, right? So it's uh, yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, right. And that man, she sounds great, hey? Oh. Oh, what a yeah. You know that you know that she didn't uh, she didn't even know who the headpins were. She didn't know any of the songs at all. Be being that the Quebec scene is so secular, right? You right they don't right, know yeah. the rest of Canada, right? Like right. who in the rest of Canada know who's who Rick Lapointe or uh, uh, Eric Lapointe is? Nobody. Right. You know, so there's a there's a whole separate music scene in Quebec all in its own, right? So yeah, it's pretty cool. cool. But she, cool. yeah, she the first those three days of rehearsals that we did, she was just, you know, she was just kind of talking through it. And after the first day, we we're all looking at each other going, uh, I don't know, you know, and she was saving herself for the show. And when, when she, when we did the show at the hard rock, man, she just pinned it. Right. And just yeah. blew the roof off the dog. Oh, eh? yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. So we're going to have a lot of fun this summer. It's going to be great. Yeah. So, that's going to be great. Yeah, yeah, you right guys meet, so, you, you know, you'll, you'll have some fun with her too. Excellent. I'm looking forward to that. I have to get her on the show sometime too. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I was thinking about Sean's story. This is just one of my own, own little stories I'm going to throw in here. When Sean was talking about like taking a cab to a gig, mm -hmm. I remember a time when I was in the band Life on the Road where we were on the road without a vehicle. <laughs> Literally. We've all been there. Like, uh, so our five piece band broke up in Jasper 
And then uh, me and, one, and my longtime partner, we put together something else. And so, you know, of course, the band had had the big five ton, you know, mm -hmm. So, of course, we didn't have that anymore. So, we're in my mom's house and we spent about six months in the basement putting the show together. And so, we're not making money while we're doing this. And so, we're basically poor, but we want to get back on the road. And so, uh, the agent lined us up a bunch of gigs. And I remember it was the dead of winter. And my brother in law packed us up and drove us to Domain, Saskatchewan. If you can imagine, it's like two streets. The whole town is like two streets <laughs> <You're> there. <laughs> in the dead of winter and, and dropped us off there. And it's like, well, we'll just, we'll figure something out. I always, I've always kind of had that. I'll figure something out. Yeah. So we get dropped off and, and then we find out there's not even a restaurant in town. So now we're stranded. There's nowhere to eat except for the restaurant in the next town. We have no vehicles. So we don't know how we're going to eat. We don't know how we're getting to Saskatoon the week after. But talk about where there's a will, there's a way, Michael, because I, I just started, you know, cause I was the girl. So around Thursday, I would just start schmoozing some of the locals and, having drinks with them and then by sunday i have us a ride and and you know we just a couple of locals would load us our, our stuff and they took yeah. us to saskatoon and you know we, we paid for their gas and i think bought them a case of beer or, or whatnot and uh and then on to saskatoon and then the same thing around wednesday i start trying to look like who you know who looks like they might want to do something on sunday and and we did that for i swear to god a couple like maybe two and three months even yeah on the road without a vehicle until we had enough money to to that's, to buy you know, that's, that's so <laughs> typical of what we did, you know. Yeah. Can you imagine how many bands were traveling every Sunday to the next town all the time? You know. It, oh yeah. It, it, it's mind-boggling to think, and I know, and, and I and I only remember after doing it, the club thing for so many years, I only remember like a handful, maybe, maybe a couple accidents that happened. You know. Yeah. You know. We, like, that was always my know. biggest fear. That was always my biggest fear. You know. Yeah. Was, oh yeah. yeah. I mean. Well, <laughs> just never know what's going to happen, right? So yeah, one hundred percent. So here's another story. Can I tell you? I was, well, I was well, you oh, you know what? I've got one from Paul Denton. Uh oh. I've got one from Dinty. Dinty. So he says, uh, "I believe our band name at the time was Jaded Heart, uh, and the club was Livewire in Calgary." Yep. If any, hey, if anyone you. remembers, good. That was a great venue, hey. Yes. Uh, uh, Age of Electric. We played there twenty six times. Oh, that's got to be a record. Yeah. We were <laughs> what do you think, right? for like three, four years. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. Cool. Yeah. So anyway, so anyway, Paul's, sorry. No, no, that's all good. Chime in anytime. That's what the show is all about. So, uh, so Paul says uh, they were at the library in Calgary. Um, oh, okay. So if everyone remembers bringing your own pyro back in the '80s, then you can relate. <laughs> then you can relate to what happened next. This is not going to end well. I think. <laughs> So he says, this was between sets, our light man, uh, Pyrotech, loaded the flash pots with gunpowder and then went up to the room for a few drinks with the boys. After a few too many wob wobbly pops, he had forgotten that the flash pots had already been loaded and proceeded to reload them. <laughs> oh, no. Well, about 30 seconds into the first tune, they exploded with the biggest blast you could ever imagine. We lost power to the stage. Gun smoke <laughs> filled the club. Uh, after the smoke cleared, we looked up and the flash pots had blasted through the roof. Uh -huh. <laughs> Man. Uh, I looked down and to my surprise, a huge piece of wood was sticking through my front monitor right where I had been standing. Funny enough, we never got fired. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, we flipped the breaker and continued on with the set with, yeah, with the hole in the ceiling. Giving new meaning to the show must go on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Paul, for that one. That, that was almost a typical Guy Jones story because they used to use, they used to blow off some pretty serious pyro all the time, right? So, yeah, right. yeah crazy. Right. Have pyro, have pyro, will travel. <laughs> I've got. Uh, I was with a band called Section Eight. Uh, that was my first road band doing sound for, and we had gone to Vancouver to play at Outlaws. Right. And we were like the second last band or third last band to, to play there as Outlaws and it became Metro after that. So on the Saturday night, uh, Candy, who was the owner, says, uh, we got Iron Maiden and Twisted Sister coming in tonight. Right. They're on a night off. Really? No. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happens. So we were doing the first set and 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 the third set. They had hired a band called Marillion, who was like a... Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? in a in a club like it was weird like a prog rock band and you know 
all the girls, big hair, you know, like what? So anyways, that meant we had to do our first set, tear down our stuff. They set up and play, they tear down, da da da. Anyway, so I'm, I'm mixing away and all of a sudden I look and here's this little guy in a bomber jacket. It's like Bruce Dickinson I go, And then there's Steve Harris, Dave Murray, right? It's like, wow, they're here, right? <laughs> yeah. This gentleman come up to me and uh, he says, hello, mate. I go, hey, good to see you, sir. Sounds great. Oh, thanks. Appreciate that. He says, uh, where can a bloke get a, a flap of blow? He goes. A flap of blow? Cocaine. Okay. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Right? I go, <laughs> just, just ask any waitress, I said. Right? <laughs> Anyways, I says, tell you what, uh, I could score for you. Right? So I did. Michael, you said, badass. You badass. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, he goes, well, where could we go do this? Right? And Bill, and his name was Bill Barkley. He was, he was uh, the guitar tech for Dave Murray. Right. So we go up to our dressing room and here we are doing lines, the guitar player <laughs> and myself and Bill Barkley and that. So anyways, uh, it's Saturday night. We now go do our set. We finish. We're supposed to be tearing down. The party is raging upstairs. And one of the coolest things I saw, John Presker, our guitar player, was the hugest uh, uh, Jimmy fanatic. I mean, he knew every Jimmy song there was. He could, he could mimic everything, right? And Dave Murray come up to me, and this is one of those moments you wish you had a video camera. Right. He come up to me and he says, hey, man, I noticed you're playing one of those new Kramer guitars with a Floyd Rose on it, right? He says, yeah, how do you like it? Oh, good. He says, yeah, I just, I have a Kaler on mine. I'm not sure. I don't really like it that much. And John goes, well, here, play it, right? He hands him his guitar, and Dave Murray does a Hendrix lick. Cool. And John looks down at him and goes, oh, that's an interesting way to play that. <laughs> <laughs> our main guy right you go what do you mean so john grabs his other strategies well i play it like this and then dave murray's now going what and for an hour these guys are jamming on hendrix licks right it was really cool like the party was on we we're supposed to be tearing down it went to like 3 30 in the morning as they're leaving bill goes hey you guys want to come to the show tomorrow <laughs> yeah right he says okay just meet me out back at the coliseum and i'll see you there so we're there at seven o'clock right and we're standing trying to stay dry and warm John, our guitar player, is smoking a joint with some guy. We don't even know who he is, right? Right. <laughs> right? Sure enough, Bill comes out, right? Hey, Mike, how you doing? Great, Bill. How many you got? There was five of us in the band, two crew guys and a girlfriend. So six, seven, eight, nine. I point out at the stranger, right? <laughs> right? And I says, okay, I'll be right back, right? And I said to this guy, I says, just, you're with us, Okay. Yeah, I don't cool. even know this guy's name. I said, just, just follow us. You're with yeah. us. Oh, I mean, don't ask questions. Yeah, Bill comes out with nine passes and gives it to me. I hand it to everybody, I hand it to this guy, right? And I said, Follow us. And we got this guy into this show, and he's like, ah, right? You guys rock. And I often, thought, I often thought him telling that story to his buddies and them going, Yeah, right, right, yeah, you know? right. yeah, right, buddy. Sure, you did, right? So. Yeah. You, you you know probably just made that that's probably a memory that he talks about now. Yeah, exactly. You know, so some yeah. some of the best road stories aren't always the crazy ones. They're like the the awesome moments like that, like or like the Gord story that you told at the beginning. Yeah, you yeah. know, sometimes they're just you know. Uh, oh oh, Tad Goddard is in the house. Oh, uh, Tad, only just ten minutes away from here. Hey, Tad, we got to get together for coffee, my friend. Yes, he's saying, "Hey, Patch, love you, bro." So uh, I love him too. You right? know. Yeah, yeah, great, great guy. And then I would say the good old days really rocked, and they and was, they really did. Wasn't wasn't just Tammy's birthday? His gal's birthday, I think, just the other day. Uh, Todd can let us know. And if it was yeah. happy happy birthday, Tammy. Yeah. Uh, James Baldry, uh, music. He's a great fan of the show. Hi, James. We love to see you all the time. He's just saying hello. Great show. Uh, hello, beautiful people. Uh, somebody wants to know if his hair caught fire. I'm assuming he's talking about Diddy's. Uh, Blowing the bar up stories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, well, no musicians were heard in the making of this show. Hopefully, every, everybody <laughs> wore a ton of hairspray. That's oh, for yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Flex nets. I, I, I have a buddy that his hair caught on fire just lighting a smoke one time. It was just like, oh. <laughs> 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 I think Michael Jackson moment. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> he just laughed. <clears throat> so. Well, here's another one, too. So, this is uh, this actually, I like this story. So this is from actually a good personal friend of mine, Curtis Vasselnack, who plays uh, guitar for this amazing metal band called Tyrants of Chaos. And actually yeah, I see just, you promoting them lots. Yeah. Oh, they're great, eh? They're just such great and just really nice humans too, yeah. aside from being talented. So, so Curtis says, uh, in the late '80s, my band Age of Beast was based in Toronto. Won a 50-band battle of the bands for a showcase in LA. 
we were the only Canadian band. We checked into the hotel, which was booked for only bands and media. And we were thinking that this was the shit. Our room had a door to an adjoining room that was filled with beer and other assorted beverages. And we thought we were pretty dumb special having all this set up for us. We proceeded to make ourselves at home, you know, drinking, eating. Uh, when suddenly Rob Halford and Glenn Tipton walked in. Oh, <laughs> can, you, cool. can you imagine? Well, you could probably imagine. Yeah. That, would blow, that would blow my mind. Uh, walking from the other room. Turns out we had been making ourselves quite at home and we're in their VIP room that was set up for interviewees. <laughs> Indulging in their rider. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we were pretty embarrassed as we sucked back their alcohol. But being good Canadians, they told us to hang out and watch the interviews. It was pretty epic. We had yeah. no idea. We had no idea who they were. Wow. Uh, okay, sorry, sorry, my bad here. About an hour later, we were partying with a few guys named Phil, Vinny, Rex, and Dimebag, and we had wow. no idea who they were at that Very time. Cool. Uh, cool. They asked, yeah, they asked us to come check out their set that night. We were blown away by this band, Pantera. Oh, cool. Quite the humbling experience. How good they were. That's a great story. Thanks, that is Curtis. Awesome. You know that I would say I saw. Um, <clears throat> Judas Priest in Calgary with Sepultura, Megadeth, and Priest closing the show. Wow. And it was the loudest thing I've ever experienced in my life. It was so loud. I was just going, oh my God, this is like. My ears are bleeding. <laughs> oh, seriously, especially Megadeth because Mustaine's guitar was like an ice pick to the ear. It was just like, whoa, right? And I'm thinking, okay, these are the warm up acts. Yeah. This like, is just going to kill it, right? <laughs> Right. They came out and they were not as loud and they sounded like an album. I never ever heard a better sounding concert in my life. Well, I, I, heard one, I did one. I saw Jellyfish at the Town Pump one night. That was really good. But right. yeah, Priest was just everything was in its place, man. It was so good. So good. Yeah. Right on, right on. I was just talking to Tom Sinclair and Pete Agnew from Nazareth. Nazareth. Parking. Right. Uh, uh, Pete called me. They're in rehearsals right now. They're coming to Canada next week. And he's talking to me, and I can barely understand the word he's saying because it's Scottish. Right. Uh, so, anyways, so Scottish. <laughs> yeah. Anybody out there wants to be a guitar tech for their three week run, give them a call. Right. So, anyways, I have a Nazareth story at the Commodore. Uh, you know, Trooper, we did a lot of shows with them. And, and, and speaking of family, you know, and, yeah. and uh, you know, that whole Nazareth gang, just what a wonderful bunch of human beings. Yeah so calm and casual and stuff so you know uh they used to have a drum tech named uh robert kennedy mm -hmm. and he always remembered my name and and here oh. you you'll you'll enjoy this because you never got my name right at the first couple times because there's been so many different versions of it right you know so i had to always, text you and ask you to spell it phonetically for I know, me so I did, right? Right? yeah sorry but for interrupting he, he uh he always remembered my name but he always say michael petraluk <laughs> i always say it that right you know Every time we see each other now, they were playing at the Commodore and I went out to see him and hang out and stuff like that. And uh, Robert goes, hey, you want to play Cowbell and Hair of the Dog? Sure. Sure. <laughs> right. So I'm standing backstage, right? Okay, here we go. <clears throat> right. Well, the live version is like 10 minutes long. Right. <laughs> right. Now here's Tom and, and Robert looking at me, just laughing at Gus because I'm dying because I didn't have a stand or anything. I'm holding this call bill. I, by the time they're done, I just fell to the floor. Right? <laughs> meanwhile, they're laughing, right? So, yeah. Yeah, they're a great band. Great, I, I, great people. Love them. Love them. Uh, when, when we were at the Headpins, we did uh, two shows with them at once, three shows. And it was at the, uh, oh God, at the Commodore. And two shows on the island and that's was sort of i remember tony our sound guy going i think this is going to be the last time we ever see dan mccafferty and the next show was his last show he you know his cop was so bad that he it literally he, just walking from the side of the stage to the center stage was really tough for him right so a wonderful human being too you know right. dan is just such a salt of the earth you know such a great guy yeah yeah was there anybody that you ever met michael that maybe you were a Probably not later, but earlier on, was there ever anybody that you met that because you were such a fan, you were, you know, slightly like starstruck? Kelly Barrett. <laughs> wow, you smooth talking devil, you. I, uh, I, might, I might have you over for dinner when you're here now, just okay. because of that. It worked. 
Uh, you know, I don't know. You know, I've, I've, I've met some pretty great people, you know, David Bowie. Oh. Uh, uh, what, was so David like? what was David like? Well, it just, you know, I was doing a show and everything like that. And he was coming at me and, and, and uh, I just stuck out my hand and I says, hey, pleasure working for you today. Right. You know, and he says, oh, well, thank you for all your help today and everything. Was, and and he, he poked his head into the crew room and says, hey, boys, how you doing? Uh, I had one. Um, we were playing at the Greek Theater, Adams, uh, about three years ago. And four years ago, three years. Anyway, uh, I was we were get, we were waiting for sound check, and I had my computer, and I couldn't get internet on on the uh, on the stage. You know, sound familiar? Uh, yeah, <laughs> been there. <laughs> and so there was. I went backstage, and there was a landing, and in, and then two stairwells going down to the dressing rooms below. Right. So I'm sitting on a road case at the top of this landing, and everything. I got my computer in my lap, and I'm da da da. And I look down and there's a couple of people coming up the stairs. And then I look again and it's Eddie Van Halen and his wife. Oh my gosh. That He's must have been up the stairs, him. right? And and I just like, holy crap, right? <laughs> so I just pretend like I didn't see him kind of thing. And he comes up and he walks straight up to me and with that, that twinkle in his eye, grin, that, yeah. that grin. Yeah. And he says, sticks out his hand and says, Hi, I'm Eddie Van Halen. And, yes, and, you are. <laughs> and and I, I wasn't quick enough to say, Pardon me? <laughs> you know, but man, wow. like I remember the morning that he died when I opened up my computer and it was, a, it was a message from Sammy and I, I screamed so loud, oh. just like, what, you know, so, wow, what a loss, yeah, you know? yeah. What a, important yeah. Loss. but him and, him and Keith Scott were best friends, Keith Scott from Brian Adams was one of his favorite guitar players, is that right, yes, and also Kim Mitchell is one of, one of Eddie's favorite guitar players too. Wow, what a yeah. compliment to Kim. Yeah, yeah. Kim exactly. is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. great. I have so, a. You got another story? No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, you know, when I worked at the River Rock and the Red Robinson, we had such a diverse amount of people that, that came to work there all the time. Like, uh, you know, I, I became quite close with Don Rickles, you know, he, oh, cool. Pat, how's it going? You know, and whatever, right? You know, and, and this is another feel good story. And we, do you know who Jeannie Cooper is? Uh, I, she's a Canadian VJ, wasn't she? Nope. Jeannie Cooper or... was the was the was the bitch on Young and Restless, the old lady, Jeannie. right? Oh, I never watched soap, so I yeah. So I anyway, she, watched she, soap was, operas. she was a really long-standing uh, um, <laughs> actress on that show. I mean, I okay. she was right from the beginning, right? Right. So she was like she was considered the bitch, right? And yeah. so we had a show where we had all these the Young and Restless cast there was about six of them and Jeannie was one of them and they'd come out individually and they would talk to the audience and stuff and everything and then it was kind of like a q a kind of thing right right and so Jeannie standing side stage with me i was i was always stage manager there and crew, crew, crew chief and she says to myself and our crew guys says you guys got any stuff like can you find me some chairs buckets brooms anything just bring everything you can right Okay, yeah. so we gathered up all this stuff on the side of the stage, right? and we're behind the curtain, right? And then so she gets introduced, she has a mic in her hand, and she goes into this rant, just, ah, nah, just screaming. And what we had to do, we had to throw all this stuff on stage <laughs> as she's walking on, like stuff is fun. And none of her cast members knew she was going to do this. They're dying, right? You know? Right. So, you know, we threw just a ton of stuff. It was stuff that's flying everywhere. She walked out. She did her thing. She did a Q and A. So what they do, they'd have people uh, going out to the audience with mics and stuff like that. And this is one of my favorite stories, right? Okay. And she, uh, they went to this one little lady. She stood up, right? And the person with the, with the mic, she goes, "I've been watching the Young and Restless from day one, and I love you." And da da da. She starts doing this thing, and Jeannie goes, "Pardon me. I've been watching it since day one. I've never missed a, an episode." Really? She says, sir, can you bring her down to the front, please? Aww. So he escorts the lady down, right? Jeannie gets off the stage, gives her a big hug, and takes her diamond bracelet. No. Yeah. Oh, my God. I just that, like, That's wow. a great, yeah. Right? And she came back, and she says, it's, it's people like you that have given me what I have. Yeah. They paid for that bracelet, basically. <laughs> 
Wow. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, run about way. That's a beautiful story. Yeah. 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 You know, you got to give back. I, 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 this is a, this is a story that Todd Kearns and I, we were talking about when I was in Vegas, like we were doing some shows last fall and, and it's, it's about fans and stuff, right? We were doing a show with Casey and the sunshine band at the river rock who, and, uh, place was packed a thousand people. And, um, he was, he was talking about this being his farewell tour. Right. By this time, Casey's got kind of a comb over. He's wearing a moo. He's kind of sweaty. And crap, right? so, <laughs> anyway, so there was a lady down front. She had an album and a Sharpie and she was trying to get his attention, right? To just get this signed, right? Right. And, and in between songs, she trying to get it and he'd do his thing and everything. And after about maybe a half hour in of the show, she, he stops, looks at her and goes, okay. You want me to stop the goddamn show just to sign your damn album? Really? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. He starts berating her, oh. right? I'm standing side stage going, buddy, what are, you, what are you doing? Yeah. And he just didn't stop, right? And I just think, I thought, it just it set the tone for the rest of the show. It was just of the course, rest of, of the course. show was flat. Yeah. And, you know, can you imagine this poor woman being at this show? She might have flown in from Grand Prairie to right. Vancouver for this show, paid for three days hotel or ticket. Yeah. She's a fan. She has your album, right? You know, so and but the the such so the, the what a horrible way to treat somebody, right? Right. And then there was two guys for the rest of the show between songs yelling, "Quit now!" Oh, good. <laughs> Quit now. <laughs> At the guy that treated her like this. So well, karma, karma, right? So when I was with Age of Electric. Uh, we Bob Rock got us tickets to see Keith Richards in the expensive winos at the Orpheum. Nice, right? Holds about 2,700 people. All of us, Todd, you know, all of us were sitting on the balcony looking down at the band, right? They're playing right. away. Keith Richards walks down to do a solo, right? This kid comes running out with a piece of paper and a pen right up to him and like right in front of him. Keith looks down at him. He looks over at Wadi Wachtel, his guitar player, and goes, he kneels down talks to the kid what's your name signs a piece of paper da, 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 hands it back to him shakes his hand gets up and continues on right oh, love it. it only love it only it. takes 30 seconds of your time to make somebody's day you know right right and, and it's even so to get down on his level that, and to kneel down and yeah I said even just to get you know to get down to the child's that level kid and, was, was running down the alley yeah you know, yeah, so yeah. On, on both ends of that, and then Todd, when I, when I told this story, Todd says, I remember that, right? So here you are at the River Rock, a thousand people are going to remember that moment with Casey, and 2,700 people with Keith Richards are going to remember that moment, right? Absolutely. You know, it only Absolutely. takes 30 seconds of your time to make a fan's day, you know, so. Right, yeah. and that, that's a good reminder, because there's a lot of musicians that watch this show. And, well, you know what? And, you know, that's a, that's a good point, you know. And, and especially at this time of what we've gone through in the last couple of years, yeah. it, you know, and the fans have, have, have stuck with it, you know, stuck with everybody, you know, so. Right, 100%. You know, the, the, the band, the musicians are very grateful for the, for, for you know, the people that have, that have stuck with it through all this stuff, right, so, yeah. Yeah, 100%. Uh, Paul Denton is just curious. Uh, Mike, do you remember banning us from drinking alcohol on your bus <laughs> due, to, due to all the pit stops we needed? <laughs> oh, we got, did you we do got that? so drunk on his birthday coming from, oh, Salmon Arm to Vancouver. And he got out of the bus. And you know the crowd barriers or the, the verbs on the side of the road? Somehow he got stuck underneath this concrete barrier. How did you get there? <laughs> Jesus. He's yelling, help, help. <laughs> yeah, oh, man. We, we, had, we got a flat tire in the bus that day. So we, we were outside of Kamloops. We were drinking pretty heavily, right? So yeah. Wow. Had a you lot know, of fun with that band. I, I was just thinking, Mike, about your, your story about the cocaine there and you and you finding buddies some cocaine. And, uh, and I'm reminded of a road story of my very own. So in the 1990s, I, um, I became fascinated with hypnosis. And uh -huh. all, these, all these hypnotists were popping up all over it. So... I remember being at West Edmonton Mall and and seeing this poster and it was like smashed in steel, you know. And, was, and I and so I walked towards it. I look and I'm like, hey, that's Jamie Pruden. I know him. <laughs> and, and then I thought in my head, you know, if Jamie can do this, why couldn't I, right? Yeah. Long story short, I went and I uh, got my master hypnosis and my clinical hypnotherapy, blah blah blah, and took it on the road. And 
So for a short time, I was Canada's only female hypnotist, and we cool. traveled around and ended shows. Very cool. And uh, yeah, and it was uh, it was amazing. And Feldman booked us kind of yeah. all over the place. And um, anyway, we were doing a show in BC, and this group of bikers came in, and and they were sitting in the back, and they were really paying attention to me, like like they they were talking while I was doing the show, and kind yeah. of. And I was getting a little bit nervous because I, I mean, they didn't look like the people that would normally come to my shows, and mm-hmm. and they were very watching very intently and. So after the show's over, they you know they kind of wave me over and and there's a, there's about seven or eight of them big guys with colors and everything and and they said hey you know how much for a private session like right now and and I'm kind of like <laughs> uh, so I was like well you know what do you need what how can I help you uh, the guy says you know we don't want to talk about it here but we need to go up to your room your partner can come and I'm like yeah of course my partner's coming yeah. so I'm going up there by myself right. So anyway, we go up, and then it's only then that they proceed to tell us that the one guy was a huge cocaine dealer, and he had gotten this huge shipment in, and he was apparently testing this product, um, and he got really high and forgot where he hid, I can't remember, oh, like, a, like a million dollars worth of cocaine, and, and his life was being threatened. <laughs> so... So they came to this show in desperate hopes that they could get a private session with me and that I would help him. Uh, and so, and, so you know, cocaine. and you, and we did, and we did. And he went, he went down like, like, like generally if people want to experience hypnosis, they're going to listen to what you say. They're going to do what they're doing. Yeah. And, and, uh, and they ended up being the greatest guys ever. And, and he figured out that he had stashed it like in some concept, you know, I, I probably shouldn't say on the earth. But anyway, but he figured out where he had a stash. And so uh, basically I felt like I kind of saved his life. <laughs> so And committed a crime. And committed a crime all at the same time. Oh, and then so he he paid me quite a nice chunk of cash. <laughs> and uh and then he threw me a little gram oh, of gram of his product and which of course we threw away immediately. Oh yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> Because you don't, we don't do coke, but we we sure like the smell of it. Yeah, no, exactly. No, I'm kidding. Exactly. I am so kidding. No, yeah. we actually we actually did throw it out, but um, you know, we weren't going to say we weren't going to say no, thank you, we don't want it. No, no. You know? But yeah, so that was that was one of the most fascinating hypnosis stories that I had. It's like during my during my time. Well, that's time. fascinating. That's a, I remember doing a show on the island, and there was a, there was a hypnotist and stuff. It was some of the funniest things. The the the, the funniest part about that sometimes <clears> is the. <throat> The unknown that happens that probably surprises you. Yes. Right. I remember this this hypnotist. It was on the Bank, uh, Vic, uh, Vancouver Island uh, exhibition, and he got these girls on stage and he got them. So they're going to be fashion models and they're going to be walking the runway right. kind of thing, right? And so they started doing it, and, and all of a sudden these two girls met. I mean, they're under, and he started fighting. Oh, <laughs> it was no. like, and even the hypnotist was going, what? You know, wow. It was unbelievable. It was like, and, and they just fought for a second and, they, and then they walked up and did their thing, right? <laughs> but there was, there was, he did this one thing where uh, when, one of the guys was uh, uh, Skipper and the other guy was Gilligan. Right? right. And they were lost. So they were out in the audience and stuff. And, and on the queue, he would, you know, say the word kind of thing. And they'd be running around the audience yelling, Skipper! Gilligan! <laughs> Always, always, it was great fun. And you're right. There were there were times when there would be you know major surprises. And I'll oh, tell yeah. you about the biggest one that ever happened to me was, and I can't see the name of the town because this is a pretty this is a pretty is this intense the mayor story. Yeah, I'm gonna tell this one because a lot of people never saw that. I show. love this story. I love it. So a tiny little town in Alberta, and uh, you know I come walking in to do the show, and and I got my hypnosis clothes on, so he knows that I'm the girl, and. And he calls me over and he's got that real like hey little lady kind of uh-huh. mentality like come here little girly and i don't believe in this hypnotist and he kept calling me a <laughs> hypnotist and and he thought it was a whole bunch of malarkey and that i was scamming the town and all this sort of stuff and, oh god and, and you know i was used to that right and i and I, so i'd give him my patented line which is you know skepticism is a sign of intelligence like feel free to watch the show and you know all good and then I would, at the beginning of the induction, I would tell people, if you want to try this at your table, go ahead. You're like, you don't have to be on the stage. So anyway, he's kind of like laughing at me as I get up there. And I'm, I'm kind of annoyed by him because he was like, he wasn't mm-hmm. just skeptic. He was rude and he was condescending. And he, and uh, so anyway, so I'm kind of doing my thing and people are going down. And then I see someone trying to get my attention. And it's this guy. And and he's he's just out right at the table. And so I, you know, I kind of walked him up and then I. And then we did the usual stripper routine where they all think they're the full yeah. monkey guys, right? And he just starts whipping his clothes off, like 
you know, boom mm-hmm. goes his shirt, and and he's like in his sixties kind of thing, right? And and uh, he's you know he's like then his belt comes off, and usually I would get to a certain point where just before yeah. I would stop them, right? And you know, <laughs> most of the time, most of the time. But because, uh, but because he had been so rude to me, yep. I I kind of forgot my my code of ethics for a minute, and I just I kind of let him run with it, and um, boom, his belt goes off, his pants whip down, he's got no underwear on. The guy's like standing like totally nude in this bar in this tiny little town where guaranteed everybody knows everybody. And it wasn't until after, like you just said, we found out it was the town mayor. (laughs) (laughs) I love that story. That is so good. That is so good. Oh, man. It's like we couldn't get out of there fast enough. It's like I'm I'm pretty sure we're never coming back here again. What would what, what have been, I'll, I'll share you one of my scariest well, stories is sh- uh, share one of yours. Yeah. You oh, scary? Oh, yeah. no, go ahead. I, I just told one, so you go. Uh, I was with Age of Electric, and we were doing uh, just a band and a trailer run. We were in Alberta, and we were traveling in, on the corridor between Edmonton and Calgary. So there was Kurt Dahl, the drummer, and our lighting guy, Ray, was, was with us. So it was just the three of us in my band and a trailer. And we're just north of Red Deer and on the freeway going. And of course, you know, you got a van full of gear. I mean, that, I mean, the, the trailer full of gear. I mean, you, it was so loaded, you couldn't get a breath of fresh air. And this thing right. was just packed, right? So it's pushing you along. And there was uh, construction, and one of the lanes had to merge. And I was in the proper lane, and this old guy cut me off, right? And literally, I almost crawled up the back of his car, right? Just right. Like, whoa, whoa. And this, you know, the, the trailer's pushing and everything. And I'm swearing at the top of my lungs. Yeah, God, man. And I'm some old guy, right? You know, well, probably my age now. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm beat, just mad, right? So anyways, I go, we get into the gasoline alley, you know, on, on the south side of Red Deer. Right, yeah. And we're going to fill up, right? Pull into that gas station, and here's that old guy walking out of the gas station or into the gas station, pay for his gas. And I'm swearing at him across the across from the, the parking lot. Just all right. So, anyways, we fill up, we go. We're driving, we're driving, we're driving. And my friend Tina, like that interview that I did with Mike, she was she was disappointed I didn't tell this story because that was one of her favorite stories. Anyways, we're outside of Red Deer, and I'm driving along. I'm on the I'm in the right hand lane and everything. And I'm just, you know I'm dueling the speed limit kind of thing. And I look behind me and there's a cop car, right? Okay, whatever. I look down, no big deal. Keep going, a couple more miles, right? Still behind me. Cars are like flying by, it's like we're standing still, right? Right. What the hell? So I just like, oh, this is weird. And then we, I could see in the median, turn out two more cop cars. And as soon as we got up to these cop cars, all the lights went on. So we got three cop cars, one back, one back, one in front, one beside me. And they're they're moving me over to the side of the road, right? And I was like, "What the hell? What's going on?" Yeah. And I looked at Kurt and I go, "You don't have any pot, do you?" <laughs> and, yeah. and they're going, "No, no, no." And so, anyways, I stop. Lights are going, right? Traffic's flying by, and we're sitting for about five minutes. Nothing's happening. And then all of a sudden, I look in the rearview mirror, and I see a cop on both sides coming down the side of the van, got their hands on their guns. One cop is now in the front corner of my van and the other cop is sliding up the side of my side of the van, right? Pokes his nose around and says, can I see your identification, please? Right. Meanwhile, the cops eyeing us the whole time. Right. And, and I, you know, I hand up my idea and Kurt's raised, da, 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 right? Sitting there, he goes back to the car. About 10 minutes later, comes back. Cop's still there. And he goes, any of you guys ever been in Blind River, Ontario? No. No. Okay. Goes back. We're there for about 45 minutes. And not knowing what was going on. Right. And then he comes back, hands all our ID back. Says, okay, you're fine. You're good to go. And I went, hold it here. What just happened? What's going yeah. on here? Yeah. Right? He says, well, you guys stopped for gas in Red Deer, right? Go, yeah, we filled up in Red Deer. Uh, somebody recognized one of you from America's Most Wanted. <laughs> and we're like, and we started no. laughing, right? Yeah. And I go, you got to be kidding me, right? <laughs> we're laughing. 
And, and he goes, yeah, I, I kind of thought, you know, you, you guys were pretty straight laced and everything. Cause I could tell when I came up on the side of the van, you were, you were pretty calm. He says, are you kidding me? I was crap. <laughs> yeah. you, know? you guys got your hands on your guns and was like, whatever. Right. You know? Yeah. And I found out later that this is where this unsolved murder was of all these people in blind river. Right. And oh, this wow. was, this was a, a thing that went on uh, unsolved mysteries or whatever. Right. That show. Right. Wow. So, uh, so at that moment, like when he when he told us that this was happening and everything, then I looked at Kurt and went, "That old bugger in red year." Oh, you know, it's, I wonder if he just out of spite called. The yeah, cops. right, right. But I've since researched it, and I looked and I found the the suspect. And it looked a lot like me with the straggly hair. Oh no! Right? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, but you know, it was a scary situation, and it wasn't until I took off that I thought. Can you imagine how many times this has happened and people freaked out and all of a sudden guns are flying or blaring and whatever, right? You know? Yeah, and you don't get away with like you don't. Yeah, get, you know they think you know, it's you and you, that's not right. Just a simple act of just reaching down to get your ID or something, right? You yeah. Know? So that was that was pretty scary. That that's a scary scary. story. Wow. I have, yeah. yeah, I don't have any stories like that. Like yeah, <laughs> that was, that was uh, a close no. one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, a few kind of ghost stories and if like a few haunted. Have you ever been in a place that you thought was haunted? Where's that place in southern Saskatchewan? South, southeastern Saskatchewan. There's there's a resort. Trooper played there and we were staying at this motel that was supposed to be haunted. I never I never experienced anything. But yeah. is there, if anybody knows that, go ahead and enter it there. I was yeah, talking about south, that, like, southeastern Saskatchewan somewhere. I was talking about the Michelle Hotel. That which place, one? the Michelle Hotel, which is, it's kind of out by Sparwood in the Crow's Nest Pass. Oh, in Southern BC. Yeah, mm. there's, everybody we knew would, ha would have a story about that place. And, wow, and, uh, okay. Yeah, it was a very, I won't get into it now because it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's creepy. But you know, yep. here's a, here, I have a story from Sean Garland. Um, and this is actually scary in, in a different level, but uh, it's a great story. So, uh, oh, Tony Demedario's old house, Tad is saying. Oh, Tony Demedario's. Yeah, Demidaris. His old house is haunted. Is okay. Home? Yeah. His old house is haunted, I think Pat is saying. <laughs> mm. So Sean Garland, uh, so this he's the Calgary lead singer of Bad Boys and Bedlam. Uh, it was 1988. I love this story. And I had just joined a road band with Neil Hanna. One night I met a girl who decided to take me home, you know, as what happens on the road. And the next no. morning, no, no, not you, because you're a that... choir boy, right? I've been on the road for 54 years and I came, I came here to get late and I'm going to, I'm going to stay here until I do. Okay. <laughs> That's your story. <laughs> so I sort of stick, stick to that. It. Yeah. Stick to that. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, this girl takes him home and the next morning I wake up to hear a man's voice screaming, get out. I look up and to my sheer horror saw the bar manager who they were working for. Oh, Turns out she was his girlfriend. And while he's yelling at me to get this crazy, while he's yelling at me to get out, this crazy woman tries to pull me back into the bed to get me to stay. Oh, geez. <laughs> it gets better. It gets better. I got up quickly, got dressed. Um, and then she says, watch out. He might punch you on the way out. <laughs> no, no doubt, right? Uh, thankfully, he let me go. And somehow we got through the week. So we had to continue to work in the bar for this guy after he had oh, man. shagged his girlfriend. Role. Yeah, that would, be, that would be a tough one. Uh, so... So, well, thankfully, he let me go, and somehow we got through the week and went on to our gig in the next town. We get there, and you will never guess who the brand new bar manager was. <laughs> Two weeks in a row. What are the odds? I know. That's funny. Uh, it was him and his new, at his new job. Um, so, you know what? It was another week of dealing with him, and his crazy woman followed them and was chasing him there, too. By the end of the week, he had forgiven me, and we ended up drinking Jack Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> no, no to self, try not to sleep with the bar manager's girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rule number one. No. Rule number one, yeah. yeah. Um, I had <coughs> at this uh, casino where I work, we had to, uh, we would, we would book the room out, the theater to uh, other organization and stuff. So they were going to have an animation uh, uh, awards night in Vancouver. Right. Right. And the MC was going to be William Shatner. Oh, cool. Right? Yeah. So, so we are working for the theater, but you know, we're just supplying labor for this, this production. So 
Shatner's like two hours late for his run through. We're waiting and waiting, waiting, right? He doesn't show up. Finally, he shows up. He's pissed off. The producer of the show didn't have anybody waiting for him at the airport. Oh. <laughs> All he knew was River Rock Casino. He had to get his own cab. He had to book his own room. Book himself <laughs> in his own room, right? And then he shows up. Now this producer is like freaking out on everything. And, and he was like, well, we got we to gotta shut her down. It was, it was, and Shatner's going, I, no, I got to do my run through with my teleprompter. I'm not going to go cold on this. There's no way, right? Right. So our production manager at the time r recognized what was going on. So he went up to him, he introduced himself, said, sir, I'm, I'm Terry. I'm the production manager here. Uh, we are separate from the animation festival here right if there's anything you need please don't hesitate to ask right and all of a sudden you can see shatner's whole thing He's calm down right it. down right yeah he says well as a matter of fact i need my meal right at eight o'clock uh, shatner's diabetic right? oh, okay. So, okay so he says i need my meal right at eight o'clock if you could do that for me okay so our terry goes and gets a, a menu for him he looks at it goes oh this looks wonderful i think i'll have the steak and the, the whatever right you know he goes to the to the uh, uh, kitchen, he walks up to chef and says, okay, this is a priority. You have to make this. It has to be in, in Mr. Shatner's room at eight o'clock sharp. Right. And chef goes, Shatner, like Captain Kirk? Like, <laughs> yeah, that one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm cooking for Captain Kirk. He goes, yes, it has to be at no pressure. eight o'clock, right? Yeah. So chef goes all out, eight o'clock, knock at the door. There was Shatner's food, right? And he's like, wow, cool. Comes down for the show, he's all tuxedo and really nice and everything, right? And and so uh, Terry goes up and says, how was your meal, Mr. Shatner? He says, excellent, it was so good. Please, please thank the chef. It was wonderful, right? Great, all right. So now I have to put his lapel mic on him, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm there, I'm Mr. Shatner, I'll get your lapel mic. So he's standing in front of me. I'm putting the mic, you know, the pack in his pocket and putting the lapel mic on. I call up to our front of house guy says, Ron, would you like Mr. Shatner to say a few things so you got good signal? He goes, absolutely, please do. Mr. Shatner, if you will, uh, just our front of house guy has requested you to say a few things just so he can get good signal for you off the mic. He says, absolutely. Right. So, Spock, and I said, and he goes into this <laughs> Perfect. routine for about 30 <laughs> seconds, and he is Captain Kirk for like That's awesome. He's, done, he's doing the whole thing, like the stutter. Nut. So, I, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I'm standing going, and he looks at him and goes, how was that? And I went, fucking awesome. I <laughs> it was cool. Really cool. Yeah. That's a, gr that's a great story. Did we go see Jan Arden? I have never seen Jan Arden. No, I, well, I have never seen her. I know. Like, she is the funniest person on the planet, which is the weirdest kind of dichotomy because of her songs are so, you know. Right. You know? They're, they're, they're serious. Like, more yeah. yeah. One of the, well, two funny stories, anyways. One of the funniest things I ever heard her say live was, you know, you always get somebody in the audience, you know, somebody yelled out, I love you, Jan. And she went, yeah, yeah where were you in high school? <laughs> Good one. She was opening for Sting at, at Rogers Arena in Vancouver. Wow. Can Hardcore, you imagine? Right? And, and she's in the middle of her show, and there's a guy walking across the floor with a big bucket of popcorn. Right? Right. And she, and she goes, hey, yells at this guy. And he's like, <laughs> give me some of that. So he starts passing this bucket all across the crowd to Jan, right to the front of the stage. She walks over, grabs a big handful of popcorn, right? And the bucket goes back to the guy. That's and awesome. Because it's just falling out of her mouth. She's laughing. <laughs> just dying, right? And everything. And, you know, so anyway, she introduces her next song. She opens her mouth to sing and she chokes on a kernel. Just, oh, no. like, <laughs> she had to stop the song take a big gulp of water right you know but what was interesting she stole the show that night from sting is that right like, oh gosh the, yeah totally stole the show the whole crowd was so into her it was really cool right i would i would love to see her actually you know i did invite i did invite jan on the show um, but she was doing her TV show. The TV she, thing, she's yeah. so busy doing her TV. She's like, I, I just, I'm like, I'm filming 14 hours. You will, day. you will laugh from beginning to end. I, she, I mean, she is the funniest person. We were doing a Terry Clark tour and, and her, her and Jan are best friends and we were in Calgary and she came to the show and, and Terry was doing good mother by herself during the tour. 
right. fire just by herself. And Jan, Jan got up and sang with her. And it was like, you could have heard a pin drop. In the I second. bet. It was I unbelievable. Bet. And she still had the diner on 17th Avenue at the time. So she invited us all to the diner. She's flipping burgers and serving drinks and stuff. She was like the mom, right? Jan and, Arden. Well, Jan Arden yeah. was? Yeah. yeah. Jan Arden was, right? So, And I was just sitting back in the shadows kind of thing, right? You know? And and so and then she goes, well, it's 3.30. Everybody get the hell out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Edmonton, right so right i was one of the last people to walk out and i you know i've I, you know i've since met her because she's bruce allen's you know with brian and everything right so right and and uh and i remember walking on i walked up and said hey jan thanks a lot for your hospitality and said, no problem she gives her a big hug and a kiss on the cheek i went oh <laughs> you know? yeah I, I love stories like that you know when you just see people being real and at their best yeah. and and you know no ego and uh and like do you find that generally, and, and you've been, you've had experience working with, you know, American artists and Canadian artists. Is there, do you find Canadians that they just have this niceness about them, like Canadian musicians? Yes. And you know what, what's interesting, you know, working with Adams and stuff like that. Uh, I, I, my first tour I did with Brian back in the early nineties, I was a PA tech. Right. And we were, our first show was in Leipzig, East Germany. And I, I never, you know, this is my first tour in Europe kind of thing. And, and, uh, I, I went out with a couple of American guys to a bar. I'll never do that again. We're in <laughs> East Germany, and these guys start doing the goose. Oh, yeah. Like the whole oh, yeah. nine yards, right? They're going, yeah. guys, what are you doing? You're going to get you us know, killed. People in Germany just want to forget about this stuff, man. You know, so yeah. that was the very last the very last time that I ever went out with, like, these guys. Anyways, but, uh, you know, the thing is that in the Adams camp, we're like, we're ambassadors for Canada. Don't That's be a jerk. Right. Don't be yes. a jerk, you know? We are, we are in the Adams gang. We are really accommodating to all opening acts. We give them everything they need. We don't, we don't squash anybody, you know, some, some bands forget why you have an opening act. Right. You know? opening and what is, and what is your definition of that? My Let's definition of an opening of, act? Of why you have an opening act. The opening act is there to warm up the audience for you. So once, once, once you're hitting the stage as a headliner, the crowd is revved and ready to go. You right. squash, you squash an opening act. They're not gonna they're, if you if you treat them like dirt, they're not gonna they're not gonna perform. Go on, screw that, right? Right. And that you know that was the one thing about Age of Electric. It was the same thing. We we got screwed around a lot, you know, before before we started really making headway, you know. And and I remember one particular show where nobody would move anything, and we were doing a a, a filming for Much Music. It was the first time we were in in Toronto, and we had a video on the you know da da da, and so they were gonna video us that night. And nobody in that band would move anything on stage. So, so Kurt was way over there. It just didn't look like a real band kind of thing, right? You right. Know? And the ironic part about it was that it was Dan Gallagher that was the big guy that was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's really the one that got Age of Electric going on much music. And and so uh, uh, the singer for the other band was like backstage. Well, what about me? What about me? Well, they're not here to see you. Yeah. You know? <laughs> So the next day we, we had to do the interview and he brought Scott Thompson from kids in the hall and, and he handed cool. the mic to Scott to do the interview. He had no idea who the band was. He thought the band was called age of Electra. So he started going <laughs> into this mystical thing. It's like, well, what is this? <laughs> yeah, no, you know, I, it's, I, I think, I think more so now in a bigger touring world, uh, everybody's pretty cool, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the really the, everybody is really pretty cool, you know, and, and, you know, and you know what, especially in Canada with all the classic rockers and stuff like that, this is one big happy family. It really is. You know, every summer is just a big, it's the high school reunion. You know, we're going, going to see Streetheart. We're going to be hanging out, da, 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 you know, so. Right. Yeah. I really noticed that. I really noticed that, Michael, when I was at Rock the River last summer and I was, I was fortunate enough to kind of go backstage and, and, you know, Meet yeah. some of the guests that I had on the show. I never got to see you that day. I was I was hoping to was hoping to run in. But I was basically stage managing the whole day for the. Oh you know, right, yeah. It. But anyway, sorry. Go ahead. You were busy, but uh, but I that's one thing I really noticed was just the camaraderie amongst everybody and yeah, and and everybody was just like have a great show. Like they were on the sidelines watching their fellow musicians and rooting them on. And yes. it was and I just and I left with such a good feeling of you know just yeah. that feeling that you know we're all in this together and well, you know you know. <sighs> We're, we've been doing this for way too long, right? We, you yeah. know, really, what do you got to prove? Nothing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, Darren, why did we get into music? To have fun, right? 
Uh, yeah. How is, the, how is it weird that you've, you've, you've had a career and everything and then it, and then it went down the tubes and then you're back out again. Right. And now, now you're having fun, right. You know, not yeah. gone down the tubes, but you know, you've had your time. Right. So, I mean, God, you know, this, this should be fun. Yeah. And it, and it really is. I'm, I'm looking yeah. forward to rock the river this, this summer. It's going to be amazing. Uh, Good lineup. It's great lineup. Did, did you hear how Todd did last night from anybody? Um, you know what? I've been so busy today. I haven't really been on social media, but I can only imagine because he was with, with Jeff Neal and Streetheart. Were you there? No, no, no. I no. wish so. But I'm going to be looking. I'm going to be looking for video tonight. Yeah, me I, yeah. too. But what a what a talent, man! <laughs> Phenomenal. Yeah, we and just saw. There, we saw two last week. There's a perfect example of what we were just talking about. Those guys, Brent, Todd, Corey, and Shane. Ambassadors for Canada, yes. the nicest people on the planet. They right? are so. And and going back to that that Keith Richards story, right? They are they are like that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's you know, the funny thing is about those guys, you know, it's like they're still just prairie guys, you know. Yeah, they're yeah, they're small town Canadian boys out of yeah. earth and and, yeah. and such talent. I'm so yeah. proud. You know, I'll close with this, Michael, because it's, you know, we're winding down a little bit here. And I, I just want to close with this. I am so freaking proud of our Canadian artists. Oh, and I, yeah. and you must be too, because you've really had some hands-on experience with almost all of them. Well, uh, quite a few, you know. Yeah. Uh, except for Lee Aaron. I don't know what their hurt problem is. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Lee. <laughs> we love you, Lee. <laughs> no, no. Everybody's so cool, you know. Yeah. So do you think there will be a book? You know, people have been asking me a lot about that, you know, like with over 700 artists and stuff like that. If I did yeah. one, page, one page per artist, it'd be hard to do one page per artist, right? Because there, there's a story for everybody, right? Right. You know? And, and you some, know, are, some are crazy and some are heartfelt and some are not. Yeah, and some well, are... Like, a, you know, like the Jeannie Cooper thing, you know? Yeah. And, and, the, and the Gord thing, you know? There's so many wonderful stories like that. And they're all out there. There's, there's a book in all of us that have done this. Yeah, well, one hundred percent. Yeah, I yeah. love the gourd. I love the gourd. The little gourd anecdote that you told. I yeah. love that. that. That made me messed up because he, I, I, you know, him and David Bowie are two of two of my like. I was I, yeah. I was supposed to I was supposed to marry David Bowie, you know, and then he went and married that rich, gorgeous supermodel. But you know, yeah, whatever. His loss, like, man. His <laughs> loss. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and gourd. I think I was I was hit the hardest when when he, you know, and and I I never had a chance to ever meet him or. Or, and or, never really saw, yeah, I never really got to see him in many interviews or anything. So for you to be able to share that little piece of what kind of a human yeah. he is, I, I love that. And you know what? He was like that with everybody. You know, right. he really was. I mean, that whole tour, Billy Ray told me that whole tour, he did it basically to say goodbye to everybody. Yeah. Right? Across Canada. Right. And to fill the rest of the guys in the band and the crew pocket their pockets. So even like he's been given a death sentence and he's still thinking of... Taking yeah. care of his, oh, yeah. his banning. Billy Ray said he had he had six teleprompters for him on stage, and Billy yes. Ray was doing teleprompter, right? And yeah. he had to phonetically do every right line right. and and the phrasing for it, right? Yeah. And they never had the same set list every night, you know. So it was it was, I mean, if you saw the the thing where they were rehearsing and stuff, Gord didn't know any of the words. I, I saw the documentary. I've yeah. I've seen it a few times actually, and yeah. and it was heartbreaking. Like he. Yeah, it was like a baby See, learning to talk for the first time. I, and... I think the, the 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 one the one interview where you see true his true humanity was the Mansbridge interview. Yeah, and Peter, Peter Mansbridge did it. Yeah, yeah. And Billy Ray was sitting right behind the camera when he was doing right. it, and it's like you know, and Gord admits I got your name on my hand because I might forget, you know. So yeah, that was that was a really that's heartbreaking. It's funny, you know, that uh, my sister has had lived in Scottsdale for like she moved back here nine years ago i guess 10 years ago she never heard of the tragically hip ever oh wow never because she, yeah. she was down in scottsdale since 88 you know yeah <clears throat> and i just happened to be in Kelowna visiting her and and that night was the final show in kingston so i'm explaining to her who gore downey is what the situation and you know and i said i toured with him and everything and you know and that and here's what's going on with him right and here's a person who never seen the band before and I looked over, my sister is just falling, yeah. falling right? Yeah. You know, it was pretty heavy, you know. It was really heavy. And you know, and I, you know that, that half of the proceeds, half of the, the money that they made at their shows in Kingston, all the shows they did in the arena in Kingston, 
they gave half the money back to the community. Is that right? Eh? I yeah. did not know that. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. That sounds like a gourd move, you know. Yeah. From what you told me about, and, like, and, you know, here's the weirdest, weirdest thing about, you know, everybody says Gord is so Canadian and stuff like that, and that it's like the ultimate Canadian. He was, in reality, he was slag in Canada in a lot of ways, right? Because, you just you know, just the like, look at the you know the indigenous thing and stuff like that. You know, he, yeah. he was he was saying thing. It was kind of tongue in cheek some of the stuff he said, as much as it sounded super Canadian. It was kind of tongue in cheek. Not, no, I'm not really praising Canada. I'm kind of cutting it down for not jumping on this or that. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, not not always, but, but there were some songs that were just like, mm, come on, guys. A little bit of a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Wake, wake up kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I've been very up. fortunate to, to, to work with some wonderful people, you know, and, and, and I can only say four assholes. Are you going to tell us who they are? <laughs> Uh, no, because there's no? Too, many out, too many fans out there. Gotcha. Uh, you know what? That's, you know what? I totally can respect that. Yeah. I thought uh, maybe you were leading up to wanting to share them. Well, so I was opening going, the door for you, what, but. What we were, going back to what we were saying before, American Canadian. Okay. These were Americans. All right, so. Okay. Gotcha. I'll, well, you know what? When I see you in Saskatoon, I'll tell you the stories. Okay? You'll tell me then? Okay. I will tell you <laughs> You've the got story. a deal. Hey, I just I actually want to take a second and give a huge shout out to my It's Such a Show sponsors, Writers and Rockers Coffee Company. Coffee. At Kathy. <laughs> Kathy. Have you tried any of it? I have not. You I, have to I, try I some. Lee Aaron is the newest brand. Landon. Oh, is that right? I am a Kathy aficionado. I, um, Kathy. My, my, my brand is a very famous brand out of Vancouver called Turks Milano's Coffee. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Awesome. I'm gonna I'm gonna be calling it Kathy from now on. Kathy. Let's go Kathy. Kathy. That's an Ontario's that's an Ontario it? Yeah, that's that accent, Kathy. Yeah. Dance. We're gonna Great. dance after we have Kathy. But uh anyway, yeah, so uh, give it a shot, writers and rockers.com. Check it out, everybody. There's uh, some really cool uh literary blends as well as the musicians that uh that like Lee Aaron and and uh I have the Coney Hatch right here. Coney Hatch. Comes in pretty bags, makes great gifts. And it's just really, it's damn good coffee. Todd Kearns has a blend I've got up on the shelf. And uh, yeah, so check that out. And yeah, huge shout out to Writers and Rockers. Thank you so much for helping me to bring these shows to you every week. What is this? Coney Hatch. Coney Hatch. Do you have Barry a story? Connors. Is there a story? <laughs> Next time you do one of these, it's Barry Connors. Okay. Okay. He bring, has, oh, gotcha. He's got he stories? the funniest road stories out of <laughs> anybody I know. Honest to God. He's been on the show and he's told me he told me a couple and he he would be great for sure. I was talking to him yesterday morning. He made me laugh. I almost fell off my chair. Some of the stories he told me. So it's like we've been best friends for a long time. He's a great guy. I love, oh, I love, love him. Yeah. He yeah. showed up on the show with little pink cat ears. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. That yeah. was awesome. <laughs> right on. Well, Michael, I can't thank you enough for spending spending the last hour and a half with us and sharing uh, not just your stories but part of this is your life that you're sharing with us and uh, and. Uh, Really Kelly, appreciate it. I, I, I thank you, Kelly. A great show you got going on. This is awesome. Congratulations to you for a great show. Thank you. You know, you, 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 you're bringing everybody closer to, to us, the musicians, whatever, right? You know, people want to know this stuff, right? You know? What, I think so. Think? so. So congratulations on that, right? So thank very you cool. so much. And, I appreciate and, that. And uh, thanks for all the uh, hellos from people tonight. It was wonderful. Yes, thank you everybody for stopping in. I'm sorry, there were so many comments. I just there's no way I was gonna get to them all, but we yeah. I sure do appreciate you stopping in. And uh yeah, take care. We'll see you in the summer, Michael. We will see you in Saskatoon. Next month. Yeah, in the we'll... summer, listen to me in the summer, like it's fall right now. We'll see you next month. Time's yeah. flying, eh? A couple, summer's, I know. Summer's flying by. Just like yeah, wait till you get to be my age. It's like <laughs> so. Okay, we, we will see you this summer and we'll go for Kathy. Okay. We'll go for Kathy. So okay. you got you got yourself a date, mister. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Take Love care, you, Michael. Thanks a lot for having me. Okay. Take care of yourself. My pleasure. I'll see you in a few weeks. You okay. betcha. See you soon. Okay. Bye -bye. Thanks so much, everybody, for watching. I'm Kelly. Have an awesome week. Uh take care of each other. Stay safe and sane. Be really nice to each other. Bye-bye. Take care now.